Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 83rd uh, Airhex TV question and answers live show the first Monday of the month always at 8 p.m. CET. Um, so a couple of questions. The very first one. Oh, of course. Before we start with the questions, uh, uh, first, um, something new. So um, after the last workshop in uh, December, I got ideas of uh, for new workshops. And the first one will talk about different style, architectural style. I got lots of questions when to use, you know, uh, whether monoliths are uh, still usable or what about microservices, serverless, event-driven and CQRS or whatever. So um, there will be one workshop just uh, focusing on architectures from the code perspective, from Java perspective and talking about the pros, pros and cons. Uh, this um, build event-driven applications with streams um, and, and uh, usually I will use mostly Kafka in this workshop. I already announced it a couple of times, so there are already uh, this is almost closed. So there are already sufficient or sufficient almost attendees overflow. And uh, then I got another idea in the workshop also announced is best practices hex and front end patterns with vanilla web components. What this means is in this workshop I want. Uh, start with web components again or you know the basic technology and just focus on structure best practices how to build a uh, new view you know how to separate the business logic from the uh, from the front end logic how to communicate with the back ends how to deal with long running transaction transactions and stuff like that and the second workshop i only will focus on mobile so to build um native like um mobile applications with web components so there are a couple of new announcements i think two weeks ago i announced the workshops they are also available you can also buy tickets from meetup or event bright okay uh, regarding podcasts um also a couple of interesting podcasts uh first um a podcast about the uh, with the main commit of struts 2 and uh what's also inside is the fix for the equifax uh, hack. So I had a chat about that, and, um, also, oh, and there's also some drama involved. So we we'll see in a second. And um, yeah, and this was the podcast. You know how struts happened, struts two happened, and uh, why Wukas uh, is still uh, maintaining struts. Um, and then another podcast with um, uh, Max from Red Hat. Uh, Max Anderson, Rydal um, Anderson, about his pet project and now it be also becomes part of Quarkus called JBank, how to build command, command line applications uh, with Java. Um, and this is not only that, so the, um, the JBank is a tool which uh, downloads on, is able of down, to, to download all the dependencies and create basically executable jars. So interesting, uh, interesting uh, project. And um, yeah. This was from the podcast front, and now start with the question. So the first question from Hans Pikemath, DHBI, ask me, I have some JPA entities that contain some attributes that I need audit log for. So first, if you th if I'm thinking about uh, audits, I always you know would like to pick something like Enverse, which automatically, Hibernate Enverse, for instance, will, would automatically log the changed entities in a table uh, and you can search for uh, all the entities. So what will basically happen is on every change, a new copy of the entity will is going to be created. Almost like CDC, but for uh, JPA. Now the question is, I know that the entity, entity listener, I know the entity listener. Yeah, entity listener is like you can have uh, interceptors for, uh, for JPA entities. And um, is there a way, but, and he will and the problem is um, uh, is probably too much work and is there a way to see which attributes are changed without storing a copy of the record using postload exactly the the classic pattern for that is to have so called uh, before image and then after image is your change set and you would have to compare know what changed but thankfully uh, this is proprietary is not covered by jpa but hibernate knows something about entity entry and what the entity entry is the entity entry is a um this is exactly what you are searching for it is like it reflects the uh, entity in the unit of work and um so um the problem is you cannot ask the entity because uh if this is a uh, assume you, yeah it ha you have to use transactions and there is only one instance of the entity per transactions there cannot be two 
it would be inconsistent. So there could be two if you disable this, this zero level transaction cache, but usually uh, they are not. So there is uh, there's only one entity in 99% of all cache uh, entity instance, POJO instance in cache. So if you change something, you change actually the entity in the cache. But what uh, the, um, the uh, runtime is doing, it is maintaining in so-called unit of work all changed entities or deleted entities and all created entities. And in the end of the trans transactions, the entities are going to be stored or synchronized with a database. And um, the um, capable frameworks, what they can do is they will just you know uh, see what really changed and uh, they will uh, create an efficient update with all the fields which changed. So, uh, but this is not mandatory. You could create a JPA provider which always writes the entire entity uh, back to the database. So, and therefore, this is a proprietary extension and this is called uh, entity entry. And uh, there is somewhere get. There is a method called, huh? Get entity key, get extra state, get loaded state. I saw it actually. And the, um, you get, and this is strangely formatted, wait a sec. So uh, what you should see, you should see a, get deleted state. So it is, what wait a sec all methods instance methods um i saw a method it is on the uh, entity entry so i just uh, loaded it once again let's see uh you get a list of attributes which changed this is what uh, you what should uh, see is not delete deleted state get extra state get loaded state entity persister and there's something like attribute state, so you get get changed attributes, so you get a reference to that. Similarly, um, and by the way, uh, how to search for, this is actually the contents of unit of work. So we'll have to ask the entity manager, or the entity manager, the class behind the entity manager, you know, give me your chance set. The same is true, this is Hibernate, and the same is, by the way, I can put it in the chat. So uh, now it is. And the, um, the, Object change set is the counterpart uh, from uh, from uh, Eclipse Link, and you see here we have here get changes, this change record, and get get changes for attribute named and so forth. So this is similar method from uh, from uh, Eclipse Link. The first one was from Hibernate. So um, you will have to uh, to use proprietary uh, proprietary, and um, you will have to ask the JPA implementation to get the change set. And um, yeah, entity entry, we covered that. Then I hope this was the first question is answered. Um, okay, what you could also do, you could of course, what you could also do, you could also, uh, you know, use reflection and see what changed, but you will have to maintain the, the before copy. This is always, always the point. So the next question from the HPI is, uh, and this one, it is, um, the problem is the pet, there's an old pattern called open view in session, and the problem which uh, DHPI has uh, Hans has is that um, if you have a main entity and the uh, with uh, lazy loaded n childs children, let's say you have a one to n relation and the n relation is lazily loaded. If the transaction is closed, the entire graph is detached. If you would, if you if you uh, um, if you would access the the children through the main entity, you should get an error, unresolved proxy error. I think is called in the um, in the Hibernate case. Or um, so you cannot just load, you know, the children. And uh, the question is how it's actually implemented. And um, so. Um, when does Payara serialize deserialize entity objects? Are there other things I need to keep in mind when uh, using lazy relations? So, how this works? Um, if you would use, for instance, like EJB or transactional um, uh, annotation on the uh, on the on the boundary, so this would be usually a JAXRS, uh, a JAXRS uh, boundary or uh, a class behind. So, if the transaction is closed, and when it happens, it happens. Um, so in the proxy, and the proxy is located before the actual POJO class. Uh, 
So um, then commit happens. So this is after the actual method was 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 uh, invoked. So the entire state is in memory. Then commit happens, and the um, all the entities be become detached. Hopefully the entire graph is fully loaded, and after that deserialization or deserialization happens because. You know, the transactions are handled by the business logic tier, and usually the serialization happens after that. And um, so this is the official statement, I would say. And what you could do is you can, you know, try to create uh, or to throw some errors on uh, serialization or deserialization, and you will see the stack trace when it happens. And so if you, I actually forgot to, 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 to search for that, but on my blog, you will find... Um, a couple of entries should be out more than 10 years old about a stateful EJB with um, injected entity manager. And usually the entity manager is transactional. What I did back then is I uh, injected this um, extended, uh, let's see, Adam Bean uh, entity manager extended context. And the extended context, I agree. Oh, exactly, it's uh, 12 years old. And the um, extended um, persistence context looks like that. And what's the difference? So uh, the entity graph will be never detached in this particular case. So what here happens is you can return the load and the load can be maintained uh, outside of the, uh, of, the, of the gateway. This is uh, the facade. And if it is maintained outside of the facade, you can, you can lazily load the children and uh, and you will work with um, so-called attached live entities. If you don't use this, you can only use stateless um, session beans or you know request request scoped, which makes sense uh, in, in with uh, JavaScript uh, SPAs or PWAs. So this was perfect with JSF, for instance. And um, so and then after every transaction the entire uh, entity graph is detached. So um, now what you should do is you should keep track what is detached and what is attached. So how to do that? So it's hard, but you will have to invoke all the methods, you know, all the children methods to load all the children. So what you can also do is you could use so-called entity graphs. And if you search for JPA, uh, create entity graph javadoc you should find that uh, exactly so the method is uh, create entity graph create entity graph and I put it to the show notes and with the entity graph you could have a several, like, like, how to call it, several templates where you can call and say, this time I would load, you know, this master entity with this path, and the next time this entity, so like selective eager loading, something like this. So this is what you will have to do is, and this is one of the reasons why a lot, a lot of projects use DTOs, because if you're using DTOs, you are forced to load, or uh, per definition, you're invoking all the getters, and you are loading everything, you know, to the DTO and returning it back. But if you don't have DTOs, what you can do is you can just invoke the getters without creating a DTO. So this is what you will have to do. Now, Mr. Amar Cher, I think, Dimpile, asked me, in a large project, so I hope it is completely answered, Yes, it is answered. And uh, by the way, you should not rely on the features of um, of Eclipse Link that it uh, can load, you know, the subgraphs uh, after the transactions because um, after the transaction, because then the entire graph could become inconsistent. So, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, Amar Cher from Algeria, so Mr. Dimpile, friend of the Dimpile, uh, friend of the show, asked me in a large project with multiple module, what is the best practice for naming database table? So usually we never had specific names for tables. They are mostly uh, um, dictated by the database administrators usually. And uh, if not, uh, we try you know, to name it them after the business domain. And usually, we um, I try to name it um, um, in, in singular. But what I know, Ruby and Rails, you know, always name the tables in plural. So like uh, posts, 
I would call a navel a, a table a post, but this is you know matter of, of, of flavor. Um, so um, so um, a better idea is if you can do this, just uh, always prefer schemas because then you can separate, you know, to isolate these schemas, which are way better than using them in conventions. So, um, and then the next very good question is, I want to inject microprofile properties in an application scope bean. So it means it is only injected once uh, using config source from a database or external file using the microprofile config SPI. If the property is updated in a database, will it be changed in the application without restarting the server? Um, so um, it depends, of course. This is the proper answer to, to everything. And if you search in the spec, and we'll copy this to the, to the chat, so in the uh, spec, um, if you do this, at inject config property uh, vehicle name, so this is going to be injected once and it won't magically change. W in a request scope, it will be injected on every request. So then, then it will be change, of course. But uh, what I actually wanted to show you is the uh, provider. So this is... If you inject something you can use the so-called dynamic config source and the dynamic config source you would inject the provider of long and then the provider is injected but you will have to call timeout.get and you get always the fresh result so um, what you will have to do is you will have to look up the values over and over again or use request scoped or use the uh, so-called dynamic config source the providers and then it will work for you and uh, this is the entity graph, exactly what we already mentioned. Okay, I hope you are happy. So, now, Mr. Aldo Luschka from Milano, from Italy, asked me, using Gouge and Hoodie Play causes this exception, already exists. Any idea why the only fix I found was commenting out the gauge? So, this is, could be an interesting case. So, what I did is, so I created a small example. And the small example is a greeting resource with injected gauge POC. And uh, in the gauge POC, I used dependent uh, scope with a number of episodes as a unit. And this is the get ehx TV episode 83. So now um, I think the Quarkus is, is not running. Um, then. Okay, then I would like to start it. So Maven clean uh, compile uh, clean compile uh, compile compile Quarkus dev. So it started, and let's see what happens. So if I will go here and say host 8080 slash hello then I get nothing because why not hello localhost And if I try uh, metrics application, still nothing, which is a pity. Actually, it should answer because it localhost uh, 8080. Oh, now it answers. Um, and hello also answers. So um, never use browser, always use curl. And then metrics metrics application so uh no answer but what you already saw is uh this so it already complains that you should use um application scoped or singleton with gauges nothing else so Actually, the correct answer or the correct application would be to use application scoped with gauge, which makes sense. Uh, cannot resolve that. Why not? So now, 
and with that should work better so still the answer but um I think it's still running something in the background because this should work. What um, what you should see... Wait a second. I just will force the update of this. So... Um, should work. Should work. Return. Hello. Air hackers. So now let's see plus this park dot should work. Okay. Now hello air hackers application metrics. Ah this could be metrics are not installed, right? Rest assured though they are installed. So then I cannot actually explain you this. So um, it uh, should work. I'm assuming something is running in the background. The point is, um, <laughs> before the show, I played with it and it always reloaded. And uh, then I tried to break it with the dependent and now I broke that, right? So I um, tried the very first time, very last time. So let's see. Uh, maybe clean package and then do it again. Ah, the test should break actually. Yeah. Forgot to delete the test. This can be an issue. Maven compile. Uh, yeah, compile Quarkus dev. And let's see again. So, hello. Curl localhost eighty eighty metrics. And I think this might be a problem. HTTP. Still not no idea why there are no metrics should be. Um and it also worked. But having said that, I remember I had a problem with Whitefly with gauges as well one time. So I had gauges and other metrics in a single class and this caused problem. So if you encounter that, this is probably a runtime bug. So it always worked with Whitefly, except now. <laughs> but I remember there was a problem either with Whitefly and I, as I, what I remember, there was an gauge and I had other metrics as well. And I had to comment out the gauge. This was the solution to the, to the problem. And, um, and I actually even used this gauge annotation in the micro profile training. So you can also take a look on that with different runtimes. So unfortunately, there are no metrics today. Uh, but yeah, but usually it works well. Okay. And uh, use um, uh, if you have gauge, you have to you will have to use application scoped or singleton pattern. Okay. Ah, localhost. Nice chat, you saw. Works perfectly. Now, um, and in browser, oh, already locale host. And this is already, it's not working right now because I killed the server. Okay, this is that. And then the HPI again. I'm using JSON to send to our JXORS endpoint, which updates data in my database. I want to be able to send partial requests. So how to do that? And for partial requests, you should use a page HTTP, HTTP. It is also available on REST. So do I have here? So uh, Florin and Ivan, thank you a lot for the local host. This is my, my classic problem. But what you can do here is you can use here uh, a patch. So it's also available. And with patch, you know this is a partial update. So you don't have to send the entire entity you can send a subset of the entity. You can either send a JSON B object, a subset of the entity, or a JSON P, which is a hash map, JSON object. And 
What I would do then is, um, what you need is the primary key of the entity and the type, of course, but you will have to load the entity with find, you get the entity back, and then it will just override with the data which comes from over the wire, the, uh, the attributes. And, um, and how to do that, you could use, for instance, reflection, right? So you can, you, you can reading uh, the attributes from left and applying it to the right. So this, this would be simple. Okay. And uh, what you could also do is, if the entity on the right is a, is a JSON B entity, I think it should work. Then you could try, you know, to, uh, and, and now, um, yeah, you, you have to fiddle with, with the parsers, but you should be able to uh, serialize, you know, the, to uh, serialize, no, to deserialize the JSON P object into a JSON B object as well. So this, this also works. So I use patch and then it should work. So, and if the entity is a JSON B object, and then you could use not the small ints rather than integer and long, the, 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 you know, the, how to call it, the wrappers. And then null is just unset, and then you can differentiate between, you know, not set and zero. And this should also work because you get a JSON B object over the wire with public fields. And this JSON B object can be absolutely an entity. So then there is nothing to do, right? So either use a JSON B object with public fields, usually, with uh, wrappers, and then it's solved. Or you use traditional JPA entities, you send a JSON P patch, which is patch is actually meant to be. J uh, JSON P uh, patch is um, going to. <laughs> Patch is going to be meant for partial updates, and JSON P is perfect for that because uh, if you have a JSON B object, you know, usually for partial updates, most of the attributes are, are not going to be used for partial updates. So, uh, thanks, of course. So now, patch done. And next one. So how do you implement database schema changes in CI uh, pipeline? So how to apply? So usually with FlywayDB, and um, either there is an, a dedicated step, it's a Jenkins, so we have uh, yeah, uh, defined step or stage. And um, uh, I don't use the uh, liquid base a lot because uh, it abstracts more than I like. So with liquid base, and sometimes if there is no pipeline, uh, we use uh, we used startup singletons for that, but pipeline is the you know the classic approach. So you would ship either a dedicated module, so you can have you know one Maven project which only cares about FlowerDB, and this project is going to be checked out in the in the pipeline, and then you would run the database changes before you actually um, uh, deploy the actual application. And by the way, there was also a nice conversation in the. Ahex FM podcast recently, Ahex FM, and this was with databases and business analysts with Ben Broom. And this is one of the questions. You know, I ask him, you know, how to how to deal with uh, database changes, and it's always hard, right, with relational databases. Um, now, I think this is the very l last question, but very good one. So Florian asked me on Docker Hub, all the Jakarta servers have relative big images, for example, JBoss, Whitefly, Latest, and so forth. Is there a slim alternatives? Um, um, one I can think of is Quarkus, but I want to remain in the Jakarta e service world. Is there a way to make a uh, current service slimmer? The problem or the problem is if I go to workspaces on Doc Lens and then try to pick what I did recently, let's say Whitefly, maybe this is the recent version of Whitefly, and take a look on Whitefly docker file, you will see that what I always do is, is it is based on Java 14, and the Java 14 image, see the Java, let's go to Java 14, It's based on CentOS 8. And CentOS is a little bit uh, out of fashion, or, or out of fashion, uh, end of end of life, sorry. Um, 
there is the center stream and the center stream is this um, like uh, I would say the future and um, so and what I have to do actually tomorrow is um, we are in we using Quarkus in a project but uh, my client uses CentOS so what we will do is we will migrate the docker file to CentOS and um, and then the image is larger because the CentOS comes is a larger than UBI 8 or whatever and um, so but coming back to the uh, so the images are larger because what we are usually doing in projects all my Java and application server images are based on uh, on I would say, I would say stock Linux images because uh, this is the infrastructure for my clients and my clients always or sometimes buy support from the company so we are using you know the stock images this is the reason why my, the entire Docklands a repository is based on or is using CentOS as a base image because it's the most popular one and after CentOS I would use just stock Ubuntu and um, I for instance never used Alpine Linux because usually it is pointless why why this so if we switch to uh let's just briefly to here so this white flat latest is 70 max 500 max on 450 max um, but what you shouldn't forget so um, currently I'm working in clouds with Asia and AWS and in both clouds we have private registries and what happens is you would for instance let's say there are 700 max you will push the 700 max but the the main difference between application servers and and Spring Boot is um, or it at least was the Spring Boot um, always you know promoted the fat jar or uber jar um, um, deployment where everything was packaged into one large into one large jar and the application servers always separated the runtime from the business logic so um, you would ship you know these 714 max once and then 50 times a day you would just ship a, a very small war um, and not a fat jar so this is the difference so uh, the answer is i never cared about the size of the image and um, of the base image because you're only uploading it once and this also doing this here in my current projects and we are actually never used the small docker files which are shipping with Quarkus we always use you now our own docker files with uh, stock OpenJDK and stock base CentOS image um, so of course you can make it slimmer uh, so um, just use you know, something like Alpine Linux you can from application server you can throw away you know a lot of components but um, uh, the question is is it really worth you will just you know save the initial upload and actually the costs is nothing so um the uh, the first the amazon registry it is uh, based on s3 and this is i don't know whether you will probably save you know uh, a euro a month or something like this um yeah and and uh, I'm, I'm yeah and uh, for instance in my project we will never use a custom uh, jre because um uh, in my projects we are d d using in one project we are using open jdk because it was the decision from uh, from this actually tomorrow I'm going to use uh, open JDK in other project we use uh, Zulu GDK uh, open G9 in other projects but we never used uh, custom or we never slim down the Jerry there's too much risk of doing so so um, I hope it was clear but uh, of course you can slim it down the question is why and uh, what is more important about um, and then the, the the docker initial docker size is the clean separation between the infrastructure which is getting to be updated you know a few times a year and your business logic which is going to update potentially 50 times a day or 10 or two two times a day so um yeah now a little bit of drama because what uh what i recorded is a small video after the podcasts with uh with uh uh Wukas about uh about apache and what i uh what i um did then i recorded a screencast two minutes just comparing you know the contributions of um between the uh, the contributions between um or oh, the contributions the um yeah the, co the 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 commits the contributions between the Vue.js and the apache struts framework and i got funny answers you know funny funny responses like uh 
you are comparing two completely different frameworks. I really appreciate your videos and your experts in Java, but this is just a bad promotional video for struts. And the funny story is, and in this, if you look at this video, it's never my intention, you know, to promote struts. But um, if you, um, how it happened is, I think in the AHEX TV or in a, in a podcast, someone mentioned struts or I thought about struts and I took a look at the page. Does the Apache struts? And I say, okay, hey. This looks actually great. And what I did then is I click on fork me on GitHub. And then I saw, oh, there are 6,000 commits. And then I said, okay, who is behind that? And I click on the contributors. And what I saw is, you know, the steady uh, commit stream, which became even more popular in 2018. And I thought Struts is that. And this is this is the opposite. It seems like the opposite is true. And I was surprised by the pop or popularity, by the contributions. And then what I do is, okay, let's compare it with, let's say, uh, Vue.js, which I did here. And if you take a look here, uh, you go to GitHub and you go to, uh, to the uh, contributions. Where are the contributions? Uh, sponsor the projects. Country. Here, yeah. contributors. So, and it looks uh, very different. So, it was very, you know, strong at the beginning, and then it somehow dry out. And um, then I got a really interesting uh, um, a comment from from here. And the comment is the difference is that there is a new version of Vue.js actually. And if you click on this, you see that there are more contributions still, but by by mainly by. Uh, by even yo you but um yeah so there's the um Vue.js view next but it's not linked you know from the page so um if you compare both they are similar but still interesting right that um the apache struts is still well maintained and and still popular okay i think that's all thank you for watching see you at upcoming conferences and of course airhex live by the way all the workshops and on airhex live uh, where are they Airhex Live. All the workshops are already uh, are guaranteed to run because we have uh, a lots of registrations already. So uh, thank you for watching and see you at upcoming conferences, uh, workshops, um, podcasts, or the next Airhex TV in March. So thank you and.